All right, so let's, let's talk about the challenges in, uh, in semiconductor design, verification, and manufacturing. If you followed the, the news in the past uh, two years, certainly during pandemic, supply chain shortages, uh, capacity for, for developing uh, types of chips that are needed, we're entering now into a, you know, a cyclical downturn in, in the semiconductor industry. Uh, it's, it's normal for the industry, but there's also systemic reasons why demand is suddenly a, a bit down, uh, macroeconomic reasons. And I say this because the semiconductor industry relies on a deep and complex supply chain to deliver the right chips for the right applications at the right time with the right performance. And these are years-long processes to develop new chips. And so the more that you can accelerate the development of chips, the verification of chips, get them into manufacturing fast, you can shorten that time and make the industry a bit less cyclical. And that's certainly a trend that we're seeing today, in particular in the fabulous community, getting those chips uh, out and ready faster. There's many other issues that will be touched on today. Sustainability, for example, how do you drive down the compute cost uh, and other costs of actually designing and verifying chips? And how do you use electronic design automation to build lower power, more efficient chips for a more sustainable world? And again, really interesting uh, domain across the, the ecosystem, whether you're talking about design verification of chips, packaging, advanced packaging, foundry, uh, out to what happens in that broader electronics manufacturing community. Today, we will focus on electronic design automation, but there's far more to, to talk about in the semiconductor and broader electronics industry. And there's certainly a role for cloud in accelerating and making more efficient that entire uh, new product introduction cycle, if you will, for electronic devices. So again, Amazon is a fabulous semiconductor company. We have design teams that use advanced EDA tools to create some of the most advanced chips uh, available today. Again, Graviton 3, 55 billion transistors, advanced node technology, system on chip. Again, very representative of some of the most advanced chips out there today. And we have also other uh, teams, Amazon devices, for example, that make uh, the, the, the products that are in many of our homes, smart devices, right, connected to the cloud. These are silicon teams that develop these. We also have uh, the Kuiper satellite division developing chips. There's just a lot of activity within Amazon in the development of new uh, infrastructure, new devices, new products using advanced silicon. So at AWS, three examples of this, of course, so starting from the, the left, AWS Nitro. This is a, a very important uh, set of chips or family of chips that we use in the virtualization layer, in the hypervisors, in offloading things that would normally be in the CPU for security, for, for network performance. Nitro is really what has enabled us to develop higher and higher performance EC2 instances, compute instances, and these are custom silicon that's used in our networking layer and now in the servers as well to offload those hypervisor functions. Graviton, ARM-based instances, you'll hear about these in Mark's session as well during this talk. Graviton, as I said, a Graviton 3, 55 billion transistor chip, system on chip, using advanced EDA tools and the same methods that you would use in, in any uh, high density, high performance system on chip. Inferentia and Tranium, these are used for machine learning inference, machine learning training, respectively. Again, custom chips, custom silicon that are specifically designed for specific types of applications in cloud, in this case, machine learning. So why run electronic design automation on cloud, or really any engineering type of workload that requires high performance computing? The primary reason and the experience that we have internally at Amazon is we can innovate much, much faster using cloud-based EDA. We can try more experience, experiments, run more corner cases, right? Collaborate better with our partners and with our internal teams using cloud-based secure collaboration. And we can reduce our tape-out risks. And we also see this, by the way, with external customers running those back-end critical time enclosure and other types of workloads on cloud, that they can reduce the risk of, of missing tape-out windows if they can scale up and scale fast. And overall costs, reducing those overall costs, not only for cost of compute and storage, but cost of, uh, you know, get better use out of your EDA licenses, more efficient use out of your engineers, really drive down those costs of developing advanced silicon. And we experience this every day 
within Amazon and, and within AWS. I'm not going to go into detail into the semiconductor flow itself. Uh, Mark will talk somewhat about this, Bill will as well, but the, the, the point here is that it's complex. Electronic design automation is not one application. It's an orchestrated series of applications that are used in different parts of the design flow. Front end simulation for analog mixed signal and digital. You've got uh, uh, physical synthesis, uh, design role checks, timing analysis, power analysis, right? And then back in the, uh, in the manufacturing domain, things like optical proximity correction, computational lithography, big, big workloads that are growing fast. And in the largest uh, you know, chips out there, the most complex chips being developed, we're talking not just tens of thousands of CPU cores being run on simulations, but literally hundreds of thousands of CPU cores being deployed for some of these simulations and verifications over extended periods of time to get that chip verified and ready for manufacturing. Traditionally, high performance compute workloads, including electronic design automation, follow some fairly um, standardized uh, architectures or practices. In the world of EDA, you would typically have uh, a large compute cluster that's coupled to a large shared file system, careful orchestration through job schedulers of these different applications to make sure that you're making efficient use of licenses, getting things done on time, keeping the engineers happy and, and busy. As these clusters grow and grow and grow and the applications become more and more diverse, it becomes beneficial to start to introduce different types of hardware into the mix. Maybe you have some applications that require GPU acceleration, some that require very high amounts of memories, other that are, others that are more CPU bound. And so as the EDA cluster grows and evolves and more projects are, are, are shared on it, it becomes less and less efficient because different applications, different projects would actually benefit from a diversity of compute and storage uh, infrastructure. And that's what you get on cloud. So your first step in moving these types of workloads to cloud could be to simply replicate what you have on premise, but put it in cloud and make it more scalable. But over time, it's important to modernize and use different types of resources for different applications, more intelligent job scheduling, and find ways to optimize those flows for fast throughput. And this is the pattern that we see repeatedly with customers that are deploying EDA. Start with a specific well-known application, perhaps do some overflow of, of compute needs to cloud, but then as you migrate more, look for those areas of optimization. And compute diversity is very important in electronic design automation. And on AWS, of course, you have a wide range of processors. And in fact, this is an area where software developers working on electronic design automation can now begin to innovate. If you have access to large amounts of compute of different types, including non-traditional architectures like GPUs or even FPGAs, you can now begin to experiment with those because they're available to your customers in cloud, right? So think about diversity of compute, diversity of storage architectures, alternative methods of job scheduling, use of, for example, analytics and AI ML to improve the flows. These are things that are now possible in cloud that in the past would have been very, very difficult to experiment with on premise. So it's a really exciting time to be in the electronic design automation domain, either as a user or as a developer of these tools. I wanted to focus on some uh, compute instance availability now in AWS. If you've followed the, uh, the trajectory of compute on cloud, in AWS in particular, since the introduction of, of Nitro, since our, our first uh, you know, deployment of Graviton, for example, you've seen us develop higher and higher performance instance types and higher memory instance types as well. It used to be uh, five years ago that you kind of had a choice. You could optimize for uh, high performance, high, high CPU uh, you know, clock speeds with, the, with like the C instances, or you could have high memory with the R instances or some balance between the two with M. But now you don't really have to compromise. If you need very high performance, like four and a half gigahertz performance, and you need high memory, this is available to you now in cloud. And of course, if you want uh, you know, high performance, good performance, 
uh, with lower cost and better energy utilization, we have the Graviton option as well, as Mark will discuss. You know, here's an example, the EC2 uh, X2IEZN instance. So this is no compromise, right? You've got very high performance CPUs, x86, four and a half gigahertz, a sustained performance. You have much higher performance than the typical AWS instances. You also have a high memory in these, right? So they're a great fit for some of those tape out critical high value workloads. For example, static timing analysis, uh, right? That, that really do need that kind of performance. M5ZN, Z1D, these are great, uh, great instance types for general purpose EDA, whether it's front end uh, digital simulation, uh, analog mixed signal, or some of those back end workloads as well. Again, for high memory, X2 now, very high performance instances available with uh, Wolf Local Storage, optimized again for throughput of high performance and high memory applications. I want to focus a bit on Graviton, too. This has been really exciting to see in recent years how the EDA vendors have begun to migrate and qualify applications, customers such as ARM using these very effectively, virtuous circle of using uh, ARM processors on cloud to develop next generation ARM processors. Graviton is now available in a, in a range of instance types, uh, including higher memory instance types, GPU accelerated instance types and an increasing number of EDA applications, as Mark will show in a moment, qualified on Graviton. So I won't go into the details of Graviton. There are other sessions you can learn more about Graviton, and Mark, of course, will cover some in his session as well. I did want to close my intro by saying that in the past uh, six months, uh, AWS has been releasing uh, solutions in a solutions library. And this includes for semiconductor, EDA, and related areas in semiconductor. The solutions library that you can find in aws.amazon.com includes things like um, EDA options from some of our partners, best practice architectures, but also uh, non-EDA areas like yield analysis, for, just for example, you'll find in there, secure collaboration, uh, some increasing a focus on sustainability solutions as well. So feel free to visit the solutions library on aws.amazon.com. The link is there, and of course, I won't try to read it off for you. And we have other resources as well. If you're interested in case studies, reference architectures, uh, white papers, and so forth, videos, uh, sessions such as this that are pre-recorded, blog posts, please visit the, uh, the aws.amazon.com slash semiconductor page. There's much more to learn. I want to turn it over now to, to Mark Galbraith of ARM, talk about their experiences running EDA and other workloads as well on AWS. Take it away, Mark. Thanks, Steve. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Mark Galbraith. Uh, so I run a team called Productivity Engineering uh, in ARM. Um, and uh, so I'm going to talk, as, as Dave said, uh, about our uh, journey to, to the ARM cloud uh, and how we've used, we've been partnering with AWS to uh, accelerate our design, verification, and implementation uh, processes. Um, so I'll start off by saying just a little bit about ARM. So, um, so we, are, we don't make chips uh, ourselves, uh, so we are a, a, an IP uh, and solutions business. Uh, around 70% of the world's population uh, is using uh, ARM processor technology today. Um, 230 billion uh, ARM-based chips have been shipped to date, uh, with around 29 billion of those uh, in the last year. And if you think about where ARM technology shows up, so it's everything from uh, client devices like your, like your phone or tablet, all the way through to automotive, uh, IoT uh, servers uh, and supercomputers. And, and of course, as, as Dave said, um, AWS through Annapurna Labs uh, is an ARM IP customer. Uh, and then that IP is shown up uh, in the AWS Nitro chip through the, uh, into the Graviton ranges with Graviton 2 and Graviton 3. So looking at that, that chip uh, creation process, and so we've got here a, a, a drawing of the, uh, you know, a typical design flow from the requirements all the way through to the, the front end design and validation through that physical implementation validation, then into tape out and, and the fabrication. And of course, it's a very complex process, as we were talking about, uh, and making a chip can cost multiple millions of dollars, so the design has got to be right first time. 
And so where, where ARM shows up here is we, we provide uh, the IP, whether it's CPU, GPU systems IP, and then also the physical IP. So that's the, the, cell, the logic cell libraries, the memory compilers, and the interface uh, IP. And so we do all the, the upfront uh, design and, and validation uh, of that IP so, so our partners uh, don't need to. But of course that takes tens to hundreds uh, of millions of CPU hours and then, so, so that's the work that we do up front so our, our partners uh, don't need to. So, so why use cloud uh, for uh, ARM IP uh, design uh, and verification? Well, three main areas around efficiency, innovation, uh, and, and cost reduction. So looking at that efficiency part, and so what this is about is really matching uh, the right instance type uh, to the, the problem you've got at hand. So thinking about what you need in your flow. Um, and with the, the selection of, uh, of instance types available uh, in the AWS cloud, uh, that, that makes it really useful. And then, as well as providing the right type uh, of, of compute, you also then want to be able to scale that. So you want to be able to provide the right amount of compute um, at the right time, uh, and that unlocks the, the efficiency for the project teams. But then another consequence of that is then uh, how you can innovate much faster. And so by being able to make our teams much more efficient, uh, that also allows us to then um, supply the, the compute that's needed uh, compared to an on-prem situation where you're trying to fit all those different projects, all the different needs uh, into an on-prem fixed compute farm at the same time. That's really complicated. So when you are able to use cloud and you can use, you can scale up and then you can scale down uh, as you need to, that means that you can uh, then get, get to your quality milestones much earlier, and that also improves the time to market. But it also reduces cost. So as I said, because we've got, we're able to provide the right compute to our teams at the right time, that really maximizes the productivity uh, of our teams. And then if you were to think about, if you were to build a data center that to cope with all those spikes of need for uh, all, all your projects that are running in parallel, uh, you'd have to build a massive data center, which is then, in the less busy times, uh, is going to be sitting idle for a good period of time. So, uh, so cloud really helps you to reduce that, that total cost of ownership. Okay, so that's why, why cloud, but then why use, why use ARM in the cloud for those EDA workloads? And, and as Dave mentioned earlier, uh, we've been working with AWS for uh, really since 2019 uh, and really focusing on the, the Graviton 2 uh, processor. And so what we find there is a 40% improvement in price to performance, three and a half times uh, performance per watt, um, all at about 20% lower cost uh, than the, the x86 uh, base instances in the, the fifth generation there. And so using those EC2 uh, instance types with, with Graviton, whether it's general purpose, compute optimized, memory optimized, storage optimized, or accelerated computing, that gives us the best uh, overall, overall option. And then, as Graviton 3 has come out, and we've got, now got the C7G instance uh, available, we see a 25% improvement in performance, three times improvement in ML uh, performance compared to Graviton 2, and an all worth 60% less energy consumed than, than those Generation 5 uh, x86 devices. So it, it works really well for us, and I'll give a few more examples of that in a, in a second in terms of what that really means. So. Um, so David had introduced the, the, the design flow, looking at all the different, you know, the complexity in the, the front end of the design, the back end of the design, and then in production and test. And so ARM being an, an IP company, the majority of the uh, design and validation we're doing is in that front end design, uh, but then also looking at some of the back end design. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in some of the case studies uh, later on in the presentation. But really, this is just to show you with the, the, different, set, um, the different parts of the design flow, uh, we're able to match the, uh, the, the instance type to the problem at hand. So if you're doing uh, maybe some implementation workloads, um, or it could be some formal workloads, so they're typically long running jobs that are very memory intensive, um, and so you want a specific type of machine for them. Alternatively, if you're uh, running characterization workloads uh, or it's, uh, it's unit level verification, what you're running there is you want, a, you want to really scale out huge numbers of, of much cheaper instances. So you can think of cloud as, as allowing you to apply the, the compute, uh, either the compute type 
and the scale of compute uh, for the, the problem at hand. And so we've got a selection here of the, the tools that are available that have been optimized uh, for, for ARM um, across the, the four main uh, EDA vendors there. Okay, so I've got some examples uh, on how, uh, how Graviton 3 has been performing and we're gonna compare against, uh, against Graviton 2. So this is really looking at those front end EDA workloads and so it's uh, over uh, Exilium uh, and Jas Jasper Gold and uh, Quest Simulator. So some simulator tools and some informal uh, as well. And so we've got Graviton 2 in the, the blue and Graviton 3 in the, in the orange color. And so looking at the, uh, the runtime, uh, we're you know, consistently seeing around 20% improvement uh, from generation to generation. Um, and then translating that into cost, and again, it's, it's you know, 15 to 20% improvement in cost moving from Graviton 2 uh, to Graviton 3. And now if we look at the, uh, the back-end uh, tools, and, uh, and again, we've got some, we're looking at some space simulation tools and some characterization tools here. And, and again, looking at runtime, uh, we've seen around a 25% improvement from uh, Graviton 2 to Graviton 3, and then translating that into cost, again, around a 20% uh, improvement there. So, so it's really, really uh, well, well worth uh, using the Graviton 2 family and, uh, and as much on Graviton 3 as we can. So now I'm gonna just compare a little bit against the, uh, the, the, the Graviton 3 against the latest, uh, latest x86 instance. And so what we've done here is we've taken um, a selection of simulation jobs and then normalized them against uh, the, the x86 instance. And then so what we see is um, comparing against uh, Graviton 3 for the same cost of doing that workload, we can get significantly more throughput. So, and, and again, you can see here, it's from anywhere from uh, one and a half times uh, to two and a half times uh, improvement in throughput for the, for the same cost. Uh, so, so we can see that Graviton 3 is a, a really, you know, very worthwhile for the, those EDA workloads. And so if we now look at those generations, and again, David uh, talked about these, these earlier, um, and when we're looking at the, the, the performance with the vCPU hours uh, required to compute a, a given EDA workload, uh, we've seen you know, huge gains uh, in performance uh, with Graviton 3 um, over, the, over the generations. And then as we translate that into cost, uh, we can see with the, again, with the latest, the latest instances, we're seeing around a 50% uh, improvement uh, to complete an EDA workload. Uh, so, so again, re really, really important as we go, you know, particularly if you're thinking about going from on-prem into cloud, and then you're thinking about, well, what are the costs going to look like? You know, for EDA workloads, Graviton's a, a really, really excellent choice. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a few case studies now. Uh, so I mentioned earlier uh, that we've got our uh, physical IP. So this is the, these are the logic cell libraries, uh, memory compilers, uh, and the, the interface logic. Um, and so up until, uh, you know, since we started working with AWS in, in 2019 for the, the space and the characterization workloads that we were, we were running, um, we had around 80% of those workloads running on Graviton 2 and getting all the benefits with that. And we've got a few of the tools that we've used here. And with the environment there, uh, what we're typically doing is we'd have all the, all the data would be on-prem and then we would burst uh, into cloud uh, generate results and then take those results back on prem again. But when we start to think about those implementation workloads, so they're, they're a, a really different shape. So they're typically much longer running jobs, typically interactive jobs, um, much higher memory requirement uh, is needed there. And so we really needed to have a different environment that would support us to be able to run a whole project uh, entirely uh, on the cloud. And so we, our team came up with uh, the Cloud Foundation platform, which is effectively, uh, in, in its first instance, makes it look like LSF on cloud. And it really gives you that on-prem-like environment, uh, but using cloud for the interactive sessions, giving you the compute that you need with the memory load that you need. So I'm gonna talk about that in a, a little bit more detail uh, in a second. And so just to compare, uh, so this is a, a, a high level view of our, uh, our on-prem environment. So typically, you know, you've got your authenticated users uh, are using the Exceed session. Uh, they're accessing their on-prem compute farm uh, using our LSF cluster with NetApp for storage. They've got access to the EDA tools, uh, the 
process design kits, and then they can spin up their session. So it's an innovative session that we've got here. And so well, we'll say, well, how do we run that in cloud? And so using the Cloud Foundation platform, uh, for the end users, it actually looks very, very similar to them. So again, uh, they're, they're running their Exceed session, um, but this time, what they're doing is they're accessing what to them looks like an LSF cluster, but it's in cloud. We use FSx on tap for the storage, and then we host all the EDA tools and the process design kit uh, in cloud as well. But it still gives you the same environment that you can use, and, uh, and that's made it um, much easier migration for our project teams. And it also allows you to find you know, the right instance at the right time. So you get all those benefits of cloud, and then you can scale up and you can scale down the instance types uh, as you need it based on your, your project needs. So we talked about uh, instance types, and so we've got an example here of the importance of choosing the right instance type. So this, in this case, it's an implementation workload. So the chart we've got on the, on the right-hand side is we start off with our on-prem uh, view, and this is given an idea of how long uh, a, a particular implementation workload is going to take. And what we've done here is we've varied the different instance types, uh, whether we're using symmetric multi-threading, uh, how many um, how many threads we're using for our, uh, for our, uh, for our workload, um, and then using that to try and optimize and see, well, how, how quickly can we make this, this workload run? But then, of course, we also want to look at uh, the cost, and so we're able to get the cost for, uh, for each instance type as well. And so using those two approaches together, uh, that allows you to get the best trade-off, and it allows you to get the best uh, performance uh, per dollar. So making, again, making this, this approach for implementation workloads uh, incredibly useful. So I mentioned uh, storage earlier, and again, with even you know, where, where we've got this huge selection of compute types, we've also got a lot of uh, storage options uh, in cloud as well. And so the experiments that we did um, uh, led us to conclude that FSX on tap was going to work really well for our, uh, metadata heavy uh, EDA workloads. And then and again, looking at well, what are the options to, to optimize here? And so the starting point was um, with our, our on-prem environment where we're 100% uh, SSD. But then looking at, well, if we can then look at some of those um, lower cost options, so looking at FSX on tap with the capacity pool tiers, if we can put the, the hot data in SSD and then the less frequently accessed data in those lower cost capacity pools, and say, well, well how, can, you know, how will that help us? So uh, what we found is going through to 50% SSD or even down to 20% SSD gave us virtually the same overall performance but a much reduced cost uh, by using those lower cost tiers. And it came out at two and a half uh, times uh, less. So, so again, really, really good, really good option there. So I'm going to look at a little bit more at RTL uh, verification now. And so, and this has shown us the, the impact it can have in terms of our, our project throughput. So the, the chart on the, the top left is effectively over the last uh, two years, uh, and this is the number of vCPU hours we've been using uh, each month uh, in, in cloud. And you can see it's starting to ramp up um, as we were enabling more and more projects for cloud. But then, crucially also, as well as ramping up, you can then ramp down when you don't have those, uh, those project deadlines that you have to uh, use significantly more resources for. And so that's why we can see, as we ramp up, we can also then ramp down. And you can see the, the spike um, about three quarters of the way, th the way through the period there. Uh, that's where we had a lot of projects with their deadlines uh, at the same time. And then how that shows up uh, on a day-to-day, week-to-week uh, basis. On the, uh, the lower left, what we've got here, and, and it's, it'll probably be a little bit hard to see on, on the screen here, but if you zoom right in, you can see the spikes uh, each day and then each week. Uh, and then when we, when we aren't using those work, uh, when we don't have the need, uh, you, you're just effectively not, not paying for the, for the usage. And so how does that then show up from a project execution uh, basis? Well, we then said, well, over the, the four years up to us ramping up in cloud, we were able to run for a particular product line 15 projects over a four year period. Once we started to introduce uh, cloud, uh, for a, again, looking out from the ramp up in cloud and then looking out over the next four years, 
uh, that moved to 25 projects over a four-year period, so giving us a 66% improvement in project throughput. And all during that period of the time, we didn't increase our on-prem capacity at all. That was all, all due to adding in, uh, adding in cloud. Okay, so, so data is, is at the heart of everything that we do, and we've been partnering with uh, Databricks uh, to provide uh, analytics and data warehouse uh, capabilities, and, and typically for, for our verification workloads. Uh, and that's, that's to allow us to run AI and, and ML, uh, particularly uh, for, for verification. Um, and, and of course, we, and we started off using uh, Databricks with, with x86, but then over a period of time, once Graviton 2 support became available, uh, for the same throughput, we then saw a drop in the number of machine hours that were needed uh, to then uh, com com complete those, uh, those, those workloads. Uh, so, so again, just showing that throughput per dollar improvement that, that we get with Graviton uh, shown up in, in yet another application. So as well as scaling out on the simulation-based verification uh, and the characterization workloads, we've also started running uh, with uh, formal workloads uh, in the cloud. So again, a different approach to, uh, to running, uh, running verification. And the example we've got here is using our, uh, our Cloud Runner technology. And this is one of those workloads where we effectively do the upfront compilation on-prem, but then we do the heavy lifting uh, in cloud. And so that's what we've, what we've got here. And similar to the uh, implementation workloads, the formal workloads typically need uh, large memory machines, and these are very long running jobs. So we really want to get the advantages of cloud for those, those types of workload. And so that's what we've got here uh, in this example. Uh, and formal workloads are, are different to the simulation workloads where with formal workloads, once you get your job running, the EDA tool itself then spawns up additional, and in this case, worker CPU jobs uh, to allow you to then go and complete the overall uh, task at hand. So again, clouds are really uh, a really great option uh, for those formal workloads uh, in the cloud. And so I didn't want to uh, miss, miss out our, our software developers' experience, and we found, uh, so typically uh, with our, our hardware developers, uh, we've got a, um, it's, there's a selection of EDA workloads um, that are, um, uh, that, that we use to, to execute on our hardware projects, where well, the software developers is significantly more diverse. There's a lot more different product types, so that means that you need a lot more different uh, types of um, uh, types of machine, and so uh, just a little bit of comparison there. Uh, On-prem, you know, it can take around 30 days to get a new virtual machine provisioned. In cloud, it's provisioned in seconds. So again, providing the teams uh, the the compute that they need when they need it. Uh, we're moving from a com single common uh, development environment to uh, having multiple development environments whenever you need it. And again, it removes uh, some of the, the friction for our teams um, uh, in, in their, in, when they're running their projects. Um, you're no longer restricted to having a static uh, infrastructure once it's provisioned. Uh, it's going to be, you know, you can change it as, as often as you need. And then you don't run into that problem of trying to procure uh, the hardware because the new technologies are available on tap, like the SV enabled Graviton 3, that can be integrated as soon as possible into the workflows. And it's always great to get feedback from, uh, from our project team. So again, quote from Andre here, and in his experience, they, they gained around five hours per week per engineer uh, with that switch to, to AWS. So I did want to just mention uh, the ARM cloud ecosystem. So of course, we've been, as I said, we've been partnering with AWS uh, for, for several years now with all the capabilities that are available there. But for those, you know, for our, uh, our EDA partners and our, uh, our ISV partners, um, there are uh, other cloud providers now able to provide uh, ARM-based technology. Um, and so now ARM's available in all the major uh, cloud providers uh, across, across the world. And so I just wanted to, um, just before I, I conclude, I um, also wanted to give a, a bit of a shout out to the, the Cloud Runner team been working with AWS, where uh, the team won the, the best use of HPC in the cloud um, award uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it was through running five, uh, 53 million jobs per week uh, with around 9 million jobs per day over uh, 25,800 uh, EC2 instances. So a really fantastic result, just showing the, the huge scale out uh, the team have been able to do uh, over the last couple of years. 
So, so just to con conclude then, so of course designing chips is very resource intensive and expensive, but using cloud really helps us to uh, improve productivity uh, and reduce cost. We use Graviton wherever we can uh, with all the benefits that it, it brings, and then we'll, you know, we'll be using more Graviton 3 um, with the, the added uh, benefit over Graviton 2 uh, as it becomes more available. We get the, you know, with cloud, we can always find the right uh, instance type um, for, the, for the job, and that gives us the scalability that we need to improve uh, our throughput. And this leads to happier and more productive engineers. And so, so just to, to conclude, our, you know, our ADA partners and the tools ecosystem is, is now ready for ARM and ready for ARM in the cloud. Uh, and as I said, ARM is now available in every major cloud. So with that, I'm going to hand over to, to Bill, who's going to uh, talk us through um, Marvell EDA on cloud. So, thank you, Bill. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Bill Cornwell. I'm with uh, Marvell Semiconductor. We are a fabulous semiconductor. My team is responsible for the physical implementation of all the custom ASIC products that we do, as well as the uh, processor development. So where Mark was more the front end design verification, my team is more of the physical implementation all the way to tape out. I do have teams that do design for test, as well as the, um, <clears throat> some small design verification for subsystems and things. So let me, let me start with a question uh, to the audience. <clears throat> How would you complete the following sentence? Today, when I go search for some information, be it how to write a resume, how to, uh, new recipe, how do I write a, a recommendation letter? I would usually go to blank. By a show of hands, how many of you would probably say I would Google it? I know I would, all right? Well, that answer there has uh, probably aged us all a little bit because surprisingly, it's starting to trend more and more to where people are going to TikTok to find their information. It's an interesting fact, it's maybe a little scary, but it's an interesting fact. Why do I bring that up is that the semiconductor industry itself is evolving just as how we evolve how we search for data. And we're evolving to the fact of how, how we manage our designs, how we process our designs, to also how we actually implement and work together as partners to do semiconductor design. So I wanna talk about three things, what I call design chaos, uh, smart scaling, and then also about innovate faster, but I'm gonna do innovate faster with a slightly different twist than maybe just jobs running faster. <clears throat> so design chaos, what do I mean by design chaos? I think many of you are already familiar with this type of plot. This is technology scaling as we move from 16FF down to N3E, we're able to scale the technologies down, right? This particular instance here is, is not accurate to say, hey, my logic scaling, but also accounts for the fact that your analog doesn't scale quite as much as your, your digital. What it ultimately means is I have higher instance counts. You heard tr billions of transistors on designs today that we're implementing, but we're also doing billions of instance counts on designs. When I say instance counts, how many inverters, latches, all those types of things we have to do in design. All this is, is all my, my teams today are in, operating in the billions. So this ultimately says, hey, I have increasing demand for resources, as well as increasing demand for engineering resources. So again, my teams have hundreds of blocks per design that they have to implement. Not only do they have to do it flat at the top level when they finally go to release it, but they also have to do it hierarchically as they build up their design. So again, this ultimately gets to be very chaotic. How do I get the machines, and how do I get the people, and how do I manage it? And working on the cloud helps us with the machine side of it. Their, their engineering resources is something we're still working on. So on-prem, my team does work on-prem as well as in the cloud. So on-prem, you have your, your basic interface here to where you, you have the user interface, and you have a fixed set of machines. Usually you have a machine there that's not quite up to par, but it's still there. You still have to use it, and so you're Say you're more or less stuck with it, it sounds bad, but you are, or it takes three months to get that machine replaced. <clears throat> and when we go through our, our yearly thing for forecasting, we have to forecast our needs throughout the entire year. Usually this is done at the, at the end of the year as they start financial planning for the next year. So we forecast our needs, what projects we're gonna have. We had to take inventory of what machines are there. Then we order them quarterly or based off demand, and then they're shipped. And how are they shipped? They usually come in by truck, right? So they, they show up there, 
um, later, and then they install and get online. So it does take time, especially with the supply constraints that we have today in the industry to get those machines online. Again, my teams are currently battling this with some of their designs that are on-prem. But if we move this over to cloud, we have a similar thing. The very first thing I'll say about ED on the cloud is that from my engineer's perspective, it looks and feels the same as on-prem. So they, have, they really don't know a difference. They open up Exceed on Demand just to a different instance, and it's exactly the same as they were working on on-prem. Now, if I pull up here another machine that's not happened to be working, well, it's not our problem. So we get that fixed. So we have instantaneous deployment of additional compute to address those issues. So we're not stuck with those older processors if we, we don't need them, or if a machine goes offline, we can get it replaced. If I pull up of how we forecast, again, this is the same thing I had on the previous chart from a forecasting perspective. It changes. I don't really care, we don't care about inventory on-prem. We don't have to worry about ship. We don't have to necessarily worry about install. But it does change slightly of how we forecast, because we have to forecast different types of usages, which adds a level of complexity to your forecasting. So we have to forecast both static and dynamic. And once we do that, we, we have them, we, we put in our order and we'll have them online. Again, you see this kind of scale here to show that we have additional compute that just blows up when we use our dynamic resources. So forecasting, so it does get more complex. And the, the key here is us is finding the balance of how we forecast. So static machines, they're available all the time. Our goal here is to have the max utilization. I know it's not one-to-one, -one, but I, I kind of like to say this is similar to the on-prem, right? If you've done your on-prem right, you're fully booked the entire time, right? But as engineers, engineers don't like fully booked resources, right? Because they're always having to wait for resources. And then we have the dynamic. So where we forecast these in uh, hours per month, and usually they're available in about 20 minutes. So it gives us that ability to scale up. I don't want to forget storage, because I have to talk about storage. We have to keep that up there, too. But I want to show a couple plots here, and I'll build them out real quick. So these plots here are for our pro project that we're currently executing, where this is a design timeline. So the left side of the plot is uh, the beginning of the design, where you're just starting to work. The end of the design is when you're in your tape out. The upper plot here shows the, uh, the available memory at any given point in time. Where it, so when we do our static and dynamic, it peaks up to almost 800 terabytes of data. Again, my, my teams, the designs that they're working on are highly memory dominated. Our verification teams are more compute dominated, but we are highly memory dominated. We're looking for how many four terabyte machines can we get to run our physical verification. And then the bottom part is, shows the amount of memory as a percentage of the month. So again, as we do our dynamic machines, so we say in a month has approximately 720 hours, if you say 30 days, by 24 hours. Right? We forecast that out to say, if I need a machine 50% of that time, that's 360 hours. But again, this, at any given point in time, we could peak up. If I have to run all my jobs in parallel to, to meet a tape out, I can launch them and wait less than 20 minutes to get them going. Right? So again, and again, about the memory, uh, I don't want to mitigate, forget about this. Our desire is to have max utilization. So you got to find that balance of how do we get close to 100% without hitting the 100%. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about innovate faster. So again, I wanted you to think about beyond machine tat. I want to talk about how we can innovate faster in a shared cloud environment. So a shared cloud environment allows for an, a true partnership between two companies or two groups to where they can work together as one. They work in the shared design environment to where they have the same data available to both teams directly as well as the same compute resources available. So as a, as a customer has an RTL net list they need to give us, there's no more sending it up to a Dropbox and handing it to the, the physical team to implement. They just point a file here it is, go get it. If I have a timing report, is this timing path real? Can it be multi-cycled? Can it be false path? Here's the report. I don't have to upload it to an email and send it over or do anything like that. Here's the path to the report, go take a look and let me know. And again, if there's a, la a, a late ECO or net list that comes in that I need to get, here it is. Again, minimizing the time and delay between the two teams just exchanging information. The two teams being able to work in the cloud together Re allows them to work together as one. 
And again, the joint processing of the design, many of our customers today, they don't have a full design team, but they have a couple of physical design engineers that they want to be able to work in the flow to do some experiments. Working together in a shared cloud environment allows the engineer to use the environment that's going to be used for sign-off directly and then hand it off to my team to do the full implementation. So again, this shared cloud environment allows us to innovate faster in a different manner in just how we work together versus just how fast can I get a job through. <clears throat> I'd be amiss if I didn't talk about what Marvell does from a uh, cloud-optimized silicon perspective. So every cloud application is unique, whether or not it's machine learning, um, social media, video processing, it's all different. And it all requires cloud-optimized silicon for that particular thing. So we do have general purpose, but also we do custom silicon for the cloud based off of form factor, based off of power, based off of software needs. These can be optimized for each particular application as necessary. <clears throat> Marvell also has cloud-optimized silicon portfolio that covers every layer of the cloud. We cover the machine learning, the compute, the processing power that's there. We do this both as a standard product, a customer standard product, as well as fully custom ASIC. We have all the switching necessary to develop in the cloud as well. Again, we have standard products, custom standard products, and fully custom ASICs. And then with our InFi acquisition a few years ago, we now have all the optical interconnect, interconnect available there as well to do all the communications on the back end. So again, Marvell has all the custom silicon for the cloud that's out there that's necessary. So from a key takeaways perspective, again, yes, our run times go down. We have all the latest machines. You saw Mark's data, right? How the data, and we can process data faster. That's great. Wait times go down. Engineers don't have to wait three hours for the job to launch. That is the most frustrating thing for an engineer today is that wait time, not the actual run time, because they know what the run time is. It's that when will it dispatch. So waiting 20 minutes for the dynamic resource to be available is great from a cloud perspective. All this helps with the lower time to market at the end of the day, but also, again, the productivity increase that we get from working together in a shared cloud allows us to innovate faster, not just run jobs faster. So with that, I'll, I'll leave, it with, leave you with this. So as the technology evolves, we have to evolve how we design. We have to evolve how we collaborate. And I'd ask that you partner with us, partner with Amazon to uh, design on the cloud, design for the cloud as we move forward. All right, thank you. I think I'm the last to go today. So I will leave it here with, with you. We'll be taking some questions if you have any out in the hallway. I want to thank everyone for coming in for uh, our talk today. Again, if you have any questions, Mark, Dave, and I will be in the hallway and we can answer those for you. Thank you.